Thank you so much, Mr. Green, and thank you for your uh, support as well and helping to secure our borders. You know, I want to go back to a couple of things that's been said throughout this uh, by my colleagues on the left. You know, you have things where they say, well, there's no point in us rehashing this. You know, in the military, we call something that's being rehashed as an AAR, an after action review, and the whole point of conducting those after action reviews is to, one, ensure that these types of incidents don't occur again, but also to ensure that accountability is, head, is held and we can actually go forward and make sure that the right people are there. You also continue to hear, well, we need to look at it in its entirety over the last 20 plus years. You know, as someone who had served in the United States military, so as a combat veteran, like many of my uh, colleagues who are up here, when we take command and we basically go out on operations and those operations go wrong, we don't look at the previous command and go, well, the previous command had them for the last two years and it's their training that happened in the past that's the reason for these actual incidents and mistakes. But that's what they want to do to President Trump. They want to say that, well, let's look at its entirety. Let's not talk about the Obama era. Let's not talk about the Bush era. Let's ignore August you know, 26th, which was under the Biden administration. Let's just focus on President Trump. And I wonder if that has anything to do with the upcoming elections and the fact that he's ahead in the polls and we're playing politics, which is why we're sitting here right now over strategy and over actually holding those accountable for the actions that they're responsible for. You know, I wasn't an officer, but I was a non-commissioned officer, so I worked for a living. And the command sergeant major understands that all too well. The one thing that we know is that when we deploy out, whoever doesn't come home with us is on us. We don't shuttle that responsibility and that blame on anyone. But that's exactly what everyone wants to do. I want to also just comment on something real quick. On August 31st, of 2021, President Biden claimed that the Afghan withdrawal, and to quote him, was an extraordinary success. You know, I want to play a video, if I may, and then I want to ask that exact same question, if you can please direct your attention. Now that was an American who was waving her passport at the gate that the Biden administration, that the Department of State Secretary Blinken and that Secretary Austin claims was man full time and enablement of trying to help guarantee Americans free access. And to quote Biden, he actually said, all you have to do is show your blue passport and we'll let you in. He also tried to say that there was no chaos in regards to the withdrawal. Did that look structured as loved ones go through and look through body after body to try and find their deceased loved one who had passed? Did that look like proper force protection like we would have found at Bagram Air Base? That would have guaranteed the necessary standoff, the HESCO barriers that was going to be provided, the ability to house the SIVs and P1 and P2 so we could do proper medical and biometrics before just throwing people on an aircraft that they call the greatest successful operational airlift in history, even though it's reported that almost 70 percent weren't even properly vetted. Do we call that an extraordinary success, Colonel? That video is what failure looks like. That is failure, absolutely. You're exactly right. Commissioner Our Major, what would you say on that? Sir, under the conditions that the United States military found themselves under, I believe that in that chaos and anarchy, the military had a successful mission. The conditions were less than ideal, though. But to, to, to your exact point, and you're right, the issue, and I say this, and I spent you know, over seven years of my life in Iraq, over three years in Afghanistan, Kosovo, Pakistan, northern Somalia. Was hit with roadside IEDs in 2006 in Baghdad twice, once with an EFP, which we're all familiar with. Those aren't failures by the US military and those who are wearing the uniform. It's the suits, not the boots, who are actually responsible for these types of failures and these collapses. One of the reasons I ran for Congress so I got tired of people who sit here trying to make decisions that impact 
us as war fighters on the ground, but yet they have no accountability, no understanding, and no actual on-ground experience themselves. You know, less than 17 percent of Congress is actually made up of veterans prior to this last election. Probably the reason why, to your point, Colonel uh, Kalaitis, that we have continue to have strategic military failures time and time again. This incident that occurred during the botched Afghan withdrawal of the Biden administration was because they applied political optics over military strategy. But they're also responsible for that intelligence blindness that you talk about. There was credible intel that we know was provided day after day. And I've looked at that in our SCIF, in the classified briefings, and shown the day-to-day -day where it was giving an update on what was going to occur, what was happening, where the planning was, planning's finished, execution getting ready to happen, and then August 26 happens. And that's why we have 13 of our fallen heroes and 13 new Gold Star families. And I'm here right now and proud and hold this in my pocket so I know I'm not here alone when I've got our young Corporal Sanchez, his coin right here with me that was given by his family, who I know is looking for the same accountability because his death was preventable. But so was the Americans in that video I just showed. You know, we report our 13 heroes, but the thing that hasn't been reported was all the Americans who were on the other side of that gate waiting to get in, whose families still don't have a clue where they're at. The reason I know that there's more Americans there is because whenever I heard about what was going on in Afghanistan, Congressman Ronnie Jackson called me and told me about a mother and three children that were trapped in Afghanistan that are his Amarillo, Texas, born and raised natives. And he, tr he tried to reach out to the State Department to get support. And they told him, well, we'll call and see where they're at. You know, he's, a, he's a rear admiral as well. And when he called the DOD, they told him they couldn't do anything. They were in the midst of a withdrawal. So I put a team together of former squadron members, and I had the great support of a friend of mine, Glenn Devitt, from the Sentinel Foundation, who we put a team together and flew over there and actually conducted the first successful overland rescue. Why was it overland? Because the Biden administration thwarted our efforts on three different occasions to rescue Americans, even though we had an aircraft that was scheduled to pick up 28 Americans and fly them out. You know, it's interesting to me when I talk about the Americans on the other side where they're not admitting to them because one was a woman that we were in contact with with her two-year-old son and her father, who were Americans, who we were in contact with and told to meet at Abbey Gate, who had rehearsed our entire our policy and what we were gonna do in our operational, uh, I guess our OpCon white paper, if you will. And when we found out that we weren't gonna be able to come in there and we had to reroute, we asked everyone to leave, but she still texted and told us she thought that she can still get in. That was August 26th. And when we tried to reach out to her again, we never heard from her again. So very likely, another American and her son who's dead. You know, you also talked, and Colonel, I want to just clarify this for the record. When we talked about this metric-based withdrawal, the Doha Agreement, it was very clear that if the metric was not met, the agreement was not met, that we were not obligated to remove everyone. Is that correct? That's my understanding. And it also, prior to President Trump leaving office, when he was advised by his generals that we should not go to a zero-sum game of just pulling out everyone and we need to leave advisors behind so that our Afghan partners can be ready to repel, because as we've pointed out, they started getting better then he actually changed the decision to leave military in country to ensure that it happens, correct? That is correct. So it sounds to me like President Trump listened to the generals, listened to his advisors, had an actual withdrawal plan that was based on a conditions-based agreement, but yet the Biden administration continues to say that all these failures is as a result of the Trump administration. You know, they didn't have any problem removing things like the Remain in Mexico agreement. They didn't have any problem removing other Trump policies. But this one thing, they were just absolutely hamstrung. Now, as all of you have led many men, have you ever been, when you take command, 
held to say that I can't do what I'm supposed to do to make changes for my command? When I'm in command, I'm in command. Colonel Colitis? Kalenda. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Mills. Uh, well, of, of course, when you're in command, you're in command. You've got constraints and limitations on you all the time uh, that you deal with, but you know the buck stops with, uh, with you. And that's Man. why it's unfortunate that we don't have anybody in charge of our wars on the ground, because the buck doesn't, there, there's nobody to hold accountable. So you've got the three of us here instead of the senior official who should have been uh, on the ground uh, in charge of this uh, evacuation and withdrawal. You're exactly right. Commissioner Major? Sir, I was taught from uh, a very young age as an NCO that you are responsible for everything your soldiers do or fail to do. Gentlemen, I could not agree more with the testimonies that I've heard so far today. And I just want to ask a quick spitfire question, if I may, and, and, and this is to you, Colonel Krumrick. If we held on to Bagram, could we have better protected from the country from the Taliban takeover? Bagram would have been my personal choice, and I think it would have given us a better opportunity. Would you agree that if we held Bagram, that we could have also have had two simultaneous runways running to help with our near and our evacuation as opposed to taking over just H. Chi and giving up Bagram? Well, I also would build on that and say it's really about the plan. When you decide to make your plan all about the embassy and all about H. Kaya, you've limited yourself and you've taken away any last ability to be able to enforce the Doha agreement and you threaten everything that we tried to build and all the hope that we put in that country was going to get washed away based on that decision. I completely agree with you and I would also note that the Biden administration not only tries to put on the Trump with regards to the actual withdrawal, but when the U.S. government takes over H. Kai, which is a commercial airway, then all the people who are told November 11th is this magical date that we're going to go on, who had booked their flights on August 26th, who had booked their flights on August 30th, who had booked their flights on September 1st, through Emirates, through Cam Air, through Ariana, through the other providers, the minute the U.S. government takes control over that airport, all those commercial flights got canceled, which is single-handedly responsible for the entrapment of the Americans that were actually left behind. And my last question, which I just have because all of you, especially you, Colonel, who was in charge of SOCOM, other nations, including the UK Special Forces, was actually out there rescuing their citizens to ensure that they got out, yet the US never did. Why was US soft not allowed to rescue Americans? This is an unclassified setting. I know that US soft was highly engaged and highly active. My personal opinion is the scope of what was being asked was so vast and the time that was allowed for that to happen made it an impossibility for us to be able to thoroughly be able to execute exactly what you're talking about. Thank you so much. Again, it goes back to the original point, which is that not only were these 13 heroes, their death preventable with proper planning, with proper military strategy, with ensuring that if the metric and conditions-based agreement was not adhered to, that we weren't just going to fall apart and withdraw and give everything over to the Taliban after 20 plus years of sacrifices, trillions of dollars and thousands of lives. This was a planning failure on the Biden administration, and that's who needs to be held accountable here, and I can promise you that's who will be held accountable here. With that, I'd like to recognize my good friend from Texas, Mr. Moran, for five minutes.